Hello and welcome again to the Libertarianism.uk podcast with me, Andy Duncan. Now, we've had some amazing guests. We've had some brilliant guests on this programme in this current run. But today we've got a spectacular guest who probably isn't anything like we've seen before. He's in Yorkshire. You know him, you love him. Yes, it's Godfrey Bloom. There he is. Okay, so we're going to talk. We're going to try and talk about uh, two or three things today. Let's see what we can squeeze in. Um, we're going to talk about King Charles III and his coronation and his reign over the Scepter Dial. We're going to also talk about CBDCs, that central bank digital currencies. And if we've got time, we're going to try and squeeze in the current political state of the UK. So let's see how we get on. Anyway, uh, hello, Godfrey. Hello, and thank you very much for uh, what a wonderful introduction. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's my pleasure to have you on. So um, you're in Yorkshire. Can you just? Uh, it's it, we had we've had some terrible rain. I'm in Gibraltar. We've had some terrible rain in the last few days, but it's it's nice and sunny today. Uh, what's the what's the kind of weather like in Yorkshire at the moment? Boiling hot here. Lovely sunny day. I've just got back from the Isle of Man. Uh, and it was sunny every day there as well, doing coastal walking and uh, picking up on some uh, business acquaintances that I needed to do. So, yeah, I think I'm pretty brown considering I haven't left the British Isles uh, for many, many years. That's pretty good. I, I used to live in Cumberland, not far away from the Isle of Man, and we could count the number of days it, it didn't rain, about five days a year that it didn't rain. So I think you were lucky there with the Isle of Man. Well, I've been to... We have uh, two annual holidays, uh, fell walking a year, and have done for 40 years. I think we've had in Cumberland two days rain in 40 years. But we always go in May or September. <laughs> yeah, the pretty good months. Anyway, let's yeah. get to the heart of the programme. Yeah. Um, so um, you did a, the reason I've invited you on today is because you did a fantastic video describing King Charles, um, who you described as King Charles the Woke. Can you can you just summarise your views on on King Charles the Third? What what do you, what do you think of him? Well, I'm very concerned about this actually because a lot of people who don't really understand our constitution, indeed, think we don't have a constitution, don't understand that the monarch actually has to give uh, uh, have, has to give the okay on the laws that we make. You know, it, it, it has to have uh, his signature on the bottom of it, and it goes to him. And people think that's a formality, and in the main, it is a formality. But he has a very keen responsibility, very important responsibility, and that is to safeguard the Constitution, and that's to safeguard his coronation oath, uh, the 1688-89 Bill of Rights, uh, the Tolerance Acts of the same years, uh, and the 1704 Act of Settlement. All these things are beholden to him uh, to uh, run his constitutional role, uh, and that's been slipping in the House of Windsor. It slipped when Her Majesty... Uh, uh, allowed us to join quite against her con constitutional oath, coronation oath, uh, allowed us to join the European Union. Uh, but Her Majesty was a very well-loved, globally well-loved individual uh, and was forgiven much, particularly to the end of her reign. And I, as you know, hold the Queen's Commission. I held the Queen's Commission in the army, something I took quite seriously. I was her trusty and well-beloved friend. Now, this man, this man, Charles, is something completely different. Uh, he is difficult to make an assessment of him, really. I'm not sure whether he's gullible, stupid, arrogant, deceitful, or probably all of these things. He stands on platforms with the World Economic Forum. He's an open supporter of the World Economic Forum, and I've listened to him speak in the European House of Parliament in private session. He's deeply uh, supportive of us remaining in the European Union, and he was. Uh, he is a climate zealot, uh, and of course, he is uh, deeply linked to Klaus Schwab uh, and all these other people who are really pulling the strings of our government, uh, and uh, that gives me a great deal of cause for concern. He's not just there to pull in tourists and drive around in a fancy coat. He's there to protect the Constitution. I don't believe he has any intention of doing that at all. And that's what worries me. Do you think we should maybe move on a generation? I mean, like you, I'm a, I'm a monarchist, and I, I, eventually I want to go back through a monarchy, back towards a, a bigger age of freedom. Um, but he did one thing a few years ago. He travelled 16,000 miles on five separate private aircraft 
um, in 11 days to meet Saint Greater Thunberg at the end to shake her hand and get a photo opportunity. Can we, do we, do we need a better king than someone who's such a hypocrite? Oh, of course we do. I think we're entitled to a very much better king than him. Um, uh, and the trouble is, the whole of the House of Windsor are flawed. It's a very deeply flawed house, royal house. I think you'd have to go back to the Stuarts to find uh, a royal house in this country, which is so deeply flawed. And of course, James II was booted out because of his obsession with Rome. Uh, he was a Catholic uh, and he uh, embraced the Catholic faith, uh, which is where it all started, really. Uh, the, the, the Stuart reign and the demise of Charles I and the eventually had to scuttle out of the country. Uh, because one thing the British people really don't like uh, is a king whose first loyalty is to somebody abroad, whether it's the Pope or Klaus Schwab or anybody else. And I think Charles the Woke will go the same way. And, this, and of course, the problem being his son is no better. Uh, his son shares the platform on the World Economic Forum in Davos uh, and is another uh, a Windsor uh, young man who is frankly not very bright. Uh, and the whole family, I think, the Windsor family are flawed. Bit of a shame that um, they've only got one, of course, and that was Princess Anne, I think, who would have made a good queen, a bit more like a sort of Elizabeth I. At least she isn't uh, susceptible to wokeism. Uh, she, uh, but all the rest of them seem to be. And the sad thing is they seem to think that somehow that's going to endear them to the British people. It doesn't. Most people don't like wokeism. Uh, uh, we're fed up with it. Uh, and it would be nice uh, if, if he had stood up or would have stood up and he, he wouldn't, the, the monarch, uh, when in lockdown, when the, quite illegally under our constitution, we were locked in our own houses, telling, being told who could come to Christmas dinner and all the rest of it. All of that is totally and utterly illegal under our constitution. Forget about statute law and all that kind of thing. It's got no relevance at all. Uh, it was illegal. And what, of course, Her Majesty should have done, said, I cannot... I cannot sign this. I cannot sign the accession to this uh, or emergency. It is against my coronation oath. It's against my coronation oath. Can you imagine Charles doing that? Her Majesty didn't do it. Charles won't do it. Uh, and William certainly wouldn't do it. Now, the problem is, like you, I am a monarchist too. Uh, I believe in a constitutional monarchy and a parliamentary democracy. Just not with the Windsors. <laughs> and I've looked at it. I've looked at it. I won't go into it, uh, but you can actually find a house uh, that comes down from Queen Victoria, which is actually active in German politics. Um, uh, and this isn't the place to go down that route, but I think we could find somebody a lot better and actually go down a different route, as indeed we did with the House of Orange, uh, when, uh, OK, fair enough, uh, he wasn't a particularly good king, but we changed our constitution and, and we could uh, then start with the 1688 Bill of Rights. And constitution, the constitutional monarchy uh, and parliamentary de democracy has been proven over the years. We built the biggest empire that the world has ever seen. And broadly speaking, it was a benevolent empire. Uh, and I've been all over the world. And whenever I go to the Commonwealth countries, as they now are, we are very well thought of. Uh, don't believe the BBC and don't believe the, the, the historians, uh, uh, celebrity historians on the BBC who don't know anything at all about anything, it seems to me. Uh, they're only there to sell their books and talk rubbish. Uh, we are well thought of because we built railways, sanitation, the English language, uh, and all the things that the British gave to their empire and now the Commonwealth. So we are actually quite well thought of. And that was all under a constitutional monarchy. And of course, the constitutional monarchs have done very well in times of warfare. Uh, 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 and uh, through the, the Great War uh, and uh, the 1939-45 War and these things, and they had a great role, and, and that role was by the King and, of course, the Queen Mother uh, and, uh, and Queen Mary. So there was an enormous role to play. The Windsor, the House of Windsor, have dropped the past, uh, and I think the problem is that you have uh, in, in King Charles somebody who, since he came out of the royal womb, has been surrounded by sycophants and told he's absolutely wonderful and he's marvellous and all the rest of it and everything he does is really clever. Instead of somebody saying, just a minute, your majesty, you are actually a wee bit of a prat 
and you ought to go and do some homework uh, before you open your mouth on matters of science, which you clearly don't know. You're embarrassingly stupid, uh, and so you'd be much better off uh, being quiet about these things. But he doesn't. He's surrounded by all these people who think he's a wonderful chap, uh, and he's not a wonderful chap, uh, and uh, I don't know where it's going to go. It's not going to end well. Yeah, it's always, I always think it's funny, the, the idea of James the second being chased down the Thames. I think he got to Romford and then he had to escape to France. But maybe we could find a Stuart or we could find, even go and find a Plantagenet somewhere. Um, if, though, Charles takes his political role too far and does become this political king who tells us all to eat fake meat made in factories where he eats organic meat himself, tells us we can't fly anywhere, whereas he travels around thousands of miles a week on private jets... Could this end with the end of the House of Windsors and could that take Britain into the, into the hands of a republic? It's not impossible because we have a WEF stooge in the Prime Minister, the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is constitutionally quite important, the fact he is also a WEF stooge, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is a WEF stooge, and, of course, we don't know who else is WEF. Um, everybody that we can see is WEF. Yeah. But of course, we don't know the names that we can't see. We don't know, we know the Klaus Schwabs, we know the George Soroses, we know all these people, we know the Bill Gates. But you've got the shady half of Rothschild and, and so on and so forth. You've got all these other string pullers and we're not quite sure where that goes and who holds the, the power. It's very shady and it's very dodgy. I don't think we've had such a corrupt government possibly since Walpole. The difference with Robert Walpole's government was it was actually quite efficient. It was corrupt but efficient. Ours is corrupt and inefficient. Uh, and I think nobody goes to the barricades with a full tummy. And I think what's coming down the, the, the track now is an empty tummy and unemployment, and then people will start seeking change, and they're not going to be prepared to listen to King Charles racing around the globe, posturing and posing in his private jet, the Queen's flight and all the rest of it, and eating his organic stuff in one of his many palaces and houses and all the rest of it, when everybody else is sort of chewing on bugs, supposedly, and all the other nonsense that goes with it. So we'll, time will tell. Whether it will be in my lifetime, I don't know. I'm 73. Whether or not I will see the demise of the monarch in this country, I don't know. But my wife is much younger. I think she will certainly see it, or demise in some form. Now, as well, I was going to get on to see uh, the central bank digital currencies, but while we're on the topic of this kind of WEF-ruled world, it seems to have started, I think, James Callaghan, Margaret Thatcher, Harold Wilson, let's not talk about Edward Heath too much, Harold Macmillan, all of these prime ministers in the last 80 years or so had character. But from um, John Major onwards, and I, th I think he was like John the Baptist, the, the form was perfected with Tony Blair. We've got, and then David Cameron and, and so on, we, we've got these identikit prime ministers who are dancing on the head of a pin. Now, you say you believe in constitutional democracy, but have we reached a point now where whoever you vote for, Rishi Sunak, Keir, Keir Starmer, whoever, you're just voting for the establishment, that their political range is tiny, they're, they're all crammed into this tiny little area. Is it worth voting anymore for any of these people? Uh, no, it most certainly isn't. I haven't voted for years. They're all too ghastly. I simply, at least I can now look at all these ghastly people and say, well, I didn't put them there. And of course, I live in a East Driding of Yorkshire. It's very rural. Uh, it's very conservative with a big C and a small C. Um, and Nigel Farage once uh, made a great quote, uh, and, and I use it quite a lot. He said, never underestimate the stupidity of the rural conservative. <laughs> uh, and they are wonderful. I'm a Retired now from hunting, but I'm a hunting man. My wife still hunts. We're horsey, uh, and we are not part of the county set. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't suggest that. But we we are sort of connected in the county, as one uh, one might imagine. So we have this situation, uh, and I was talking to a major landowner, one of the biggest landowners in Yorkshire, not an aristocrat, um, uh, but a very big landed gentry. A very nice man who meets his responsibilities very carefully, an extremely nice man who does everything that you know one would expect from old school uh, landed gentry, and and I have every respect for him. 
And he was asking me a couple of years ago, uh, you know, who, whether it should be Liz Truss or whether it should be Rishi Shunak and all this kind of business. And I said, it really doesn't matter uh, because they are all World Economic Forum stooges. So it doesn't matter. And he looked at me, bless his cotton and socks. He said, let's just, just remind me, what's this World Economic Forum then? What's that all about? He'd never heard of it. Wow. He'd never heard of it. And I would think probably if I talked to 90% of the people I know socially up here, they won't have either heard of it, they won't have any idea how it works or any of its implications. Uh, and this is the problem. And, of course, it's easy to blame them. But on the other hand, of course, we have a completely subdued mainstream media. It doesn't matter whether there's television, BBC, Sky, Channel 4, even the Daily Telegraph. All these people <coughs> have buried it. So people don't get any information. It was like lockdown, a vaccine uh, injuries and so on and so forth. There is no independent media now in Western Europe or North America. So you're all your average guy or girl has not heard of any of this and doesn't know its implications. And it's an interesting thing. I don't know whether you'd agree with this or anybody of your audience would agree with this. There is almost nobody as stupid, never mind as the rural conservative, as the English middle class. The English middle class are phenomenally stupid, ignorant and naive. And if you don't believe me, sneak around Tate Modern one day and overhear some of the conversations that are going on when they're gazing upon a sheet with a dog turd on it and wondering how wonderful yeah. it was and how artistic it is. These people are incredibly stupid. However, the your window cleaner, your sparky, your artisan, generally speaking, is much more wick, as we say up here in Yorkshire. They are very much cleverer and they understand things and understand how many beans make five. They're running their own little business. They might be sole proprietors. They're skilled uh, artisans uh, and they're very much more inclined to think critically than your English middle class. Uh, and around the dinner party, well, I don't get invited very often to dinner parties <laughs> these days, since, since my uh, representation of UKIP. Um, but the I have Oxford graduate friends <clears throat> around the dinner party table who are unbelievably stupid and would be embarrassed dreadfully if my window cleaner came in and sat down and discussed anything. Uh, and, you know, that's just sort of where we are. Uh, it's a sad thing. And, of course, they make up the levers of power, the civil service. Uh, that is sort of 100% English middle class, uh, privileged, index-linked, unsackable, <coughs> who, run the, who, who run the show. Uh, and, of course, their political masters uh, are of the same genre. Uh, and, of course, whoever's in charge of our political masters, these shady names like Klaus Schwab and the IMF and the WHO, so on, as well, all these people are, are calling the shots. I don't quite know why these people go into politics. They seem to be desperate. Boris Johnson and Sunak and all these people are desperate to become prime minister and get into number 10. It is the holy grail of politics. But they never want to do anything. They, I'd like to be prime minister to do things. I'd like to cut taxation, cut regulation, cut the civil service, and all these sort of things. I'd really like to do stuff if I was prime minister. These people just want to be prime minister. Uh, and this is the why they're all carbon cutouts. And what was the difference between, what's the name, uh, De Theresa May, David Cameron, John Major, Gordon Brown? They're all. I think exactly I think same. Gordon Brown was a, was a bit of a throwback. I think he was a character in the mould of, say, Harold Wilson or James Callaghan. But I think Tony Blair, David Cameron, um, John Major. I think Boris Johnson was a bit of a character as well because he, again, I think you're right, he just wanted to be Prime Minister, he, but he missed his opportunity with the COVID thing. I think he could have said to all the technocrats telling him to have lockdowns, he could have said, no, we're not having lockdowns, I'm Prime Minister. He could have had his Churchill moments and said no, but he failed. At that critical moment, he failed, he backed down, he was too lazy to read any science, he just did what his technocrats told him and he became another yesterday man. So... But, but yeah, most of them are WEF appointed clones. And if you're not, let's say maybe, let's give Liz Trust the, uh, the benefit of the doubt. She's not a WEF candidate. She just gets removed by the WEF. So 
I, th- I think we look, and I, th- I think the British middle class as well. I think so many of them are connected to the state. They they get their incomes off the state. So I think they they think they're very intelligent, but I think they can be stupid because they don't want to see where their bread's being buttered. Lawyers live off legal privileges. Doctors live off the NHS privileges. Teachers live off state school privileges. Uh, people in the city live off banking fiat money privileges. So I think some of the middle class are very intelligent, but they're they're the entrepreneurs. They're the independent people. Um, one of their roots, though, is is say the the BBC. So they all refer back to the BBC, which again is another privileged institution living off its own private kind of tithe tax. Is is there any way we can cut out the BBC? Um, from being the kind of um, intellectual prop of these people, uh, how can we get rid of the BBC? Well, <clears throat> it's interesting that the BBC is a fantastic anachronism, isn't it? I mean, it was, if, if you go back in the history and its charter back into the 1920s, it's a fascinating organisation and without doubt had a role to play. But those days have long gone. I mean, there was something like 40 or 50 free view stations that you can get if you look into your, your TV times. Yeah. <clears throat> There's the, the fact that if you do not pay uh, the BBC, you go to prison, is laughable, appalling, frightening. Uh, and, of course, it is the, the arm of the state. Uh, and you've got somebody like, what's her name, Laura Cheeseburger, who's the political correspondent, <laughs> uh, She's on something like £300,000 a year. And then there's oh. other freebie things that they get, and they're all the same. The chat with the ear rolls, who used to do the Sunday program, whose name have escaped me. Um, mm. These people are getting huge salaries. They're not there to rock the boat. They're there to ask patsy questions, softball questions, um, which is how they've managed to bury things like uh, excess deaths and the conversational debate about excess deaths. If you are a political correspondent of a of TV channel or, or a quality newspaper, if there are any quality newspapers left, which I don't think there are really these days, it is your job to really drill down on things like excess deaths, uh, the support for the war in the Ukraine, all these major aspects of what's going on today. They avoid them as best they can by trying to th- throw in the red herrings, like, like what's Harry doing now? What's Meghan doing now? Uh, what's that funny little man who's on breakfast TV whose name also escapes me and what's his relationship with the other little woman whose name escapes me? Not that I ever watch all that kind of nonsense anyway. But we live in such a dumbed-down society. It's very difficult to scramble out of this. And, of course, is that that deliberate? You have to look at the situation. Is it you? And I used to lecture a lot of universities uh, all over the country and schools uh, in this country and other countries. If you went, if you stood in front of a third year undergraduate class at Cambridge or Durham or Exeter, and I have done this sort of thing, and ask if you could, who could name five basic principles of English law, they wouldn't have a clue. They might have one, or the date of Magna Carta, the implications of Magna Carta, or the Bill of Rights, or the Toleration Act. They simply wouldn't know, and and I include third year undergrad history undergraduates and law undergraduates. All right. So we've built a whole generation who is incompetent, can't do risk analysis, uh, don't know basic facts, uh, and just go with the flow. Uh, And I spoke to give you an example there a public school. I was at a public school, an old public school. Uh, not not first division, but you know, public school nevertheless. And I spoke to their head of physics, and I said, "Why are you teaching the kids that man-made global warming, uh, man-made carbon dioxide, is somehow going to boil the planet and we're all going to die?" Because you must know, you you're a Cambridge physics graduate, that this is totally and utterly ludicrous. <laughs> I mean, it's just so ludicrous it beggars belief. Um, and he said, "Well, Mr. Bloom, he said you don't understand what my role here is." I am paid in a public school. Uh, the parents are paying me to get three straight A's for their kids, to get themselves into a university where they can get a 2-1, and so they can go into the city or get their snout in the trough somewhere along the line, and that's what they pay me for. That's what I do. <clears throat> if I got them to actually write the truth in the papers, A-level physics papers or geography papers, uh, they'd yeah. fail, and I'd lose my job. So I have to teach them this incredible bullshit 
so that they tick the right boxes. And the kids don't care because the kids are playing rugby. They want to get to university. They want to have fun, go to parties. Don't think I'm the sort of guy that's criticising that me of all people. Top stuff. Um, but uh, an education, these people, you don't get an education at a modern British university. Now, I've lectured at the Warsaw School of Economics, Warsaw University. They get an ex- uh, uh, they're getting an education. They speak three languages. Uh, they can talk about any aspect of economics, which is my subject, of course, as you know, and yours too. Um, and, and they can also discuss Napoleon's campaigns in the peninsula. These people are educated. Poles and, 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 and Czechs are educated. Our kids aren't. They're nice kids. They like a pint. I always stay for the night. It's great fun. But educated, they are not. So consequently, they're easily manipulated. And of course, Tony Benn in that wonderful clip. How do you manipulate them? You keep them stupid and frightened. And we have now 80% of of the uh, population, 80% are stupid and frightened. And I actually, over the winter, took a Smithsonian course in psychology because I was getting to the station. I, I felt I needed to understand some of this. Why do people... What is cognitive dissonance? Why do people who are quite clearly uh, uh, behaving across the most ridiculously stupid manner? You know, what, what's going on? And I still didn't get, I played, I went to 25 lectures and the books and all the rest of it. And I got to the end of it and they still didn't give me the answer. I mean, I, just to give an example of that, if I may, very quickly, I have a neighbor who's a really intelligent lady, middle-aged lady, her daughter works in France. She had, um, she had her jab, she had her booster, I'm going back two years. She had a, a, a blood clot on the brain, collapsed, lost the use of the right hand side. It was only fortunately 24, 48 hour problem. But she needed another booster in order to go and see her daughter again six months later, and she had it. She had it. You can't help some people, can you? You can't help them. She yeah. didn't go, whoa, just a minute. You know, uh, but so we we've, we've got these people who, again, middle class. It's always the middle. It's, it seems to be the middle classes, uh, the English, particularly the English middle classes, who seem to learn nothing from any form of experience, do they? And I, I and I don't understand it. Twenty percent of the population don't fall for it. Twenty percent of the population say no. I don't believe this. I can do my own risk analysis. I'll make my own decisions. But eighty percent go with the flow. And of course, in a Western democracy, you only need eighty percent. You only need 80 percent. So uh, how we get out of this, I really don't know. Well, we could have a banking crisis and that could make things uh, terribly bad. But so I I don't know whether we answered the question of how to get rid of the BBC, but I stopped watching it years ago anyway. I I, I used to watch um, Top Gear with Jeremy Clarkson, the match of the day. They were my last two programmes. They they got rid of Jeremy Clarkson, so I was down to one last programme. And then they, Gary Lineker got more and more and more political and football got more and more political. So I stopped watching Match of the Day. I now look, I don't watch anything on the BBC at all now, which is, which is a great freeing of the mind, actually. Because when you do watch a BBC news programme, you, you can feel the propaganda coming at you. So I think, I think a good advice for anyone is just to stop watching the BBC completely and hopefully it will disappear and hopefully people will eventually give it up paying their licence fees. Stop watching. You've got to stop paying. Don't pay. That'll stop it. But, but I, people complain about the BBC. Oh, the BBC's terrible, this, that, and the other. But they were, they've got a banker's order. I mean, how moronic are people? I haven't paid the BBC for years and years and years. Don't watch it. Don't pay them. Don't pay. This isn't rocket science, is it? No. Let us get back then to some of their propaganda that they're spreading. One of the things they're trying to spread at the moment is um, the, the kind of state and the fiat currency system, which has been now running for over 50 years since 1971, when uh, Richard Nixon closed off the, the gold window. So that's, I think that's created a lot of craziness in the West. Then they're scared of Bitcoin. Um, one of their responses to Bitcoin is uh, central bank digital currencies. Um, although that doesn't seem to be a problem that they need to solve with it, there doesn't seem to be some great problem that needs to be solved with CBDCs. Why do you think the state and the politicians and the bureaucrats are so, and the BBC are so desperately trying to push these CBDCs? Uh, well, 
there will be a banking crisis. It's on its way. And of course, I foretold that in 2010 in a speech in the European Union, and again in 2013, and I wrote a book about it. Uh, and it was updated, and uh, uh, that which foretold everything that was coming down the path. All this, none of this is difficult. All this is bound to happen. You cannot go on uh, with a system of, of printing money uh, that we have done in order to pay day-to-day -day bills. You, you just can't do that. Uh, I'm just astonished it's managed to last so long. So we know the banking crisis is going to come. We know the fiat currency crisis is going to come. Uh, I was perhaps got a few things wrong because I thought the European banks would be first. It turns out it's the American banks coming down first. Uh, but that doesn't matter because all banks are interlocked, as you know, and your listeners will know. Uh, they're all interlocked. So it doesn't make any difference. So when there's domino, when one goes down, they'll all go down. And of course, you've got this centralized system of being, being the world centralized system. Uh, that, that we're moving towards. Uh, and of course, uh, Rothschilds, uh, uh, you know, I think it was whatever it was, it was certainly 150 years ago, said, it doesn't matter who you vote for, it's who controls the money. Uh, and you can find yeah. it in the Oxford Book of Quotations. And it's there, and of course, he's quite right. You control the money, you, can you, you control the whole political and economic system. Uh, and so uh, so he was right. And if you bring fast forward up to uh, uh, 1912, I think it was J.P. Morgan who said, uh, only gold is money, everything else is credit. Uh, and if you then fast forward again to 1926 or 27, I think it was Henry Ford said, um, uh, if people understood how banking worked, nobody would keep their money in a bank. Uh, so it's the sort of stuff that you and I know. It, yeah, we, we know all this. But most people don't know any of this. They don't understand it. And they actually think that the a political guarantee of their deposit at the bank uh, is, is worth the paper it's written on when the whole thing collapsed. <laughs> I mean, you know, bless the cotton socks. How stupid can you be? So this is what they think. Now, they want to control. We're already seeing the uh, five, the 15-minute cities. We're already seeing all this kind of thing, control, uh, trying to squeeze out the motorist. The motorist is the devil incarnate with people having their own cars. They hate that. They want to get rid of that. They don't want people flying away on holiday. They don't want us to go anywhere, do anything, own anything. People say, oh, God, isn't that a conspiracy theory? All you've got to do is clock into the World Economic Forum website. It's quite up front. They are saying this. You've got to give credit where credit is due to Klaus Schwab. He's an honest man. He says, I'm going to screw you, and that's how it's going to be. And, then and, you get and, you, and, and you'll be happy. I'm going to take yeah, everything off you, and you'll, you'll be happy. Be happy. <laughs> and it's it's fascinating. And, the, and I've said this before, and I always say this if I'm giving a lecture at a university. In the old days, the medieval kings in the, in the 12th or 13th century, pick any century you like, they took your castle, your money, or your land, or your wife, or your gold plate, whatever it was, because they had men at arms to do so, and they wanted to fight a war against whoever it may be to prosecute their war, and they needed money to do that, usually because of this country against the French. I'm all for that. However, leaving that aside, they didn't make any uh, pretense about why they were stealing your money. Now we have our money stolen in a kleptocracy. They take this money and they pretend it's it's for our own benefit. That's the thing that I think annoys me more than anybody else, that they're taking money for my benefit. Godfrey, we have to take all this money off you in taxation for your own benefit. No, no. You take it to embezzle it. <laughs> Screw it. Look after your mates. You know, yeah. chip, be an honest crook. You know, be an honest crook. You know, be an Edward the First. you know, and say, look, I'm taking that because I've got a big sword and I'm a big fat chap. And, you know, don't pretend it's for my own benefit. I, th I liked, uh, was it Murray Rothbard? He said, he said the robber barons, I mean, the literal feudal ones, 12th century, 13th century, they would steal your money, but some hours of the day they'd actually be in their castle drinking wine and doing other things and just relaxing, leaving you alone. But the problem with these modern zealots is they're at you all the time. So we're not yeah. only just going to tax you for your own good, we're going to print lots of money and, and use that money to pay for useless, stupid government policies and projects, and that's for your own good as well. And so now you go to the shops and you look at a modest small basket of a few things, and it's £100, and you think... Good God, a hundred pounds. What was that? That was 25 ounces of gold about a hundred years ago, 120 years ago. And how much would, how much would 25 ounces of gold buy? And that's 50,000 pounds. So doing this all for your own good, it's for their own good and for their own good of, of their friends, of course. Um, so we, we can't believe anything these people say. 
You would, it wouldn't be. But they say they flaunt it. They flaunt their private aeroplanes, <clears throat> their houses. Incidentally, most of which <clears throat> in America uh, are on the beach. Yeah. We're, <laughs> one out, we're all going to drown because of global warming. Yeah. Uh, and I think to an extent people are starting to wake up. <clears throat> but what the problem is, I think, with people is that they're disengaging. They're not going to the barricades. Uh, they're not really demonstrating, uh, apart from France, of course, but, the, you know, that's in their national psyche. But um, people are just dis disengaging. And I was speaking to a landowner just walking the dogs this morning out of the village, and we had a long chat. When we bump into each other, we always do. Uh, and his attitude was very much, and, and the other landowner next door to him too, we're talking thousands of acres here, uh, their attitude is, well, we live in a quiet, shady little part of uh, East Yorkshire, and, uh, you know, we're very lucky here and let's hope it doesn't spill over. But of course, um, it will spill over. Uh, eventually, it will spill over. We're going to be the last. We will be the last town without uh, Dover boat people. We'll be the last town, probably Howden is my local town in uh, a beautiful little Georgian town, unspoiled, um, marvelous little place. But it only takes a couple of hotels, small hotels, to be taken over by Dover boat people, and the whole atmosphere of the entire town will change. And I feel deeply sorry for little seaside towns who've had this inflected on them. The working class people, honest, good, hard working class people in the cities. Getting back to CBDCs, Alice, which 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 people are worried are going to be used to control them. So you've flown a thousand miles this year on aeroplanes, that's it, you can't have any more flights. You've eaten too much red meat this year. No more red meat for you. Um, so the CBDCs will just track you. You won't be able to escape any. You, there'll be no tax avoidance of any kind because they'll know where every penny's coming in, every penny's going out. Everything you ever do will be completely tracked by the state in the panopticon state. Now, Alistair McLeod, my kind of former colleague on Goldman, he, he, he said that we don't need to worry about CBDCs because there's so many problems with them that they, they'll just fail. They'll, they'll just disappear before they even start. Do you think they'll bring them in or do you think, like Alistair McLeod, that they will fail? Yes, and I had an interview with him on my own channel and uh, at some length, and uh, he is a great guru. There's no question about that, in my view. He made a very strong case for them bringing it in and it failing. Um, I think possibly he's right. I can't see how you can manage something like that because you're going to end up, you're going to push it down bartering or you're going to, you, I don't see it, but his view is, of course, as you know, his view that the banks, the banks, it doesn't suit the retail banks. Uh, and they're the ones that subscribe money to campaigns, uh, political campaigns, certainly in North America. And I think you couldn't have a system <clears throat> in this country run by the Bank of England if it's not adopted by the Fed. I don't think that, or the or the um, European Central Bank. I, I don't think that's feasible. Um, however, I would just say one thing. I didn't think it was conceivable that the government could tell us who we could have in our houses for dinner parties at Christmas and get away with it. And they did. I took no notice whatsoever, of course. Uh, we in a little village, I built a little pub uh, and, and, and uh, the villagers came and we went through lockdown having parties every Friday night and it was great. So I just took no notice, but that's me. Most people rushed around with their face covered up like a mask can, can stop a respiratory virus. Another thing, how stupid can people be? How can you believe that? How can anybody believe that? But they do. Yeah, what it says on the box, it says on the boxes, yeah. these do yeah. not prevent it's anything. Double. They do not prevent viruses. <laughs> Absolutely extraordinary. Um, but I didn't think, and, and Sir Graham Brady, I think, in the House of Commons, if you remember, two years ago, said, government is watching you very closely, seeing what they can get away with here. And it seems to me, again, the 80% rule, that 80% of the population you could do almost anything to and get away with it because they are beyond hope, a lot of these people. Um, I had one guy, I'll give you for example, a slightly off message, but a Cambridge University man, very bright guy, very old friend of mine, 
And he said to me, we were talking about something, and it doesn't matter what it was, it, that's not relevant. And he said to me, oh, no, God, you're wrong there. I checked that out, and, it, uh, and it's been fact-checked by the BBC. Oh. This was a grown man with a Cambridge degree <laughs> telling me that it had been, I was wrong because he checked, checked by the it BBC. Checked by the BBC. Oh, Where did these people come? Where's he been? Where's he been since he left Cambridge? In a huge hole in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> now, just before we finish off, I, I did want to squeeze in one line on Brexit, but just before we do that, do you think there's any hope of CBDCs being completely squashed by some combination of Bitcoin, this new Russian gold currency based on their own cryptocurrency? W will the forces of reason smash these CBDCs before they, before they come into the world? I think they'll probably come in a bit, as it were. But if you go back, I always think you can learn from history. I'm a great one for history. If you looked at the coin clipping, for example, in the, uh, in the, in the Middle Ages, um, well, let's go back to the Roman Empire. If you look at the degradation of the denarius uh, with alloy and silver, and can that work? Uh, yeah, well, it worked for a little bit under uh, Diocletian, and that worked for a little bit. Um, but then sooner or later, people have to get hard money. And what happened to the Roman Empire? They couldn't control their borders, and they, could, and, and they degraded their currency. Yeah, so that's we've seen that. We know in the Middle Ages, the same thing. And when uh, Henry VIII died, uh, Thomas Gresham came to power and Elizabeth I and went back to hard money. It's all cyclical. So the answer, I think, to your question is, yes, I think it can come in, but nobody's going to use that kind of currency uh, if the BRICS nations are using a currency which is gold back or, or, or hard currency uh, that they can use electronically as well. I just can't see that. I can't see it happening. Um, I can see it ending in some form of shambles, but I think they'll try and I think they'll fail. And that will bring people out of the woodwork. Don't forget, when they are hungry, they've got their savings being stolen <clears throat> and they turn up for their holiday in Alicante and they can't go. Yeah. Well, let's hope you're right. I mean, I, I like the lesson from the <laughs> Roman Empire. So the, they debased the denarius. So it was just lead covered in a tiny amount of silver. But then the Byzantine Empire realised this was a problem. So they had solid gold aureuses for a thousand extra years up until 1453, solid gold money. And the same thing with the British Empire. You talked about the British Empire earlier. So Isaac Newton comes into the the, um, the mint and says, we will have a fixed gold. I think it was about a quarter of an ounce of gold for a sovereign. And the British Empire stuck with that for 200 years and massively expanded because of that solid gold money. So hopefully you're right. Hopefully we're just in the bottom of a cycle and we'll come out with proper money. I'm a, I'm a bit of a Bitcoin maximalist, so it might be Bitcoin, but it, hopefully it'll be gold or something that's not controlled by the state. Now, my last thing I just wanted to squeeze in before, because I'm looking at the clock now, I've taken up quite a bit of your time. Um, how do you think the Brexit process has gone? We, we took about five elections. I voted about five times to get Brexit over the line. Um, how do you think? It seems to me, though, that the, the British government just want to get back into the EU as fast as possible. Um, and I think we'll probably be back in the UK, uh, EU within five, ten years. How do you think Brexit's going? And do you think they'll sneak us back into the EU as soon as they can? Well, I did an interview <clears throat> several years ago now, five years perhaps, but before the referendum, certainly, uh, with Jeff Dice at the Mises Institute. Uh, and I said to him, uh, he, he said, you know, will you get it? If you, you know, so sort of And I said, well, I think we will get it. We'll win a referendum for Brexit because so many people are against it now that I think we'll win the referendum, which took the government and the civil service completely by surprise. They would never have held a referendum. But they thought they were going to lose it. So that came out. I said, but what will happen is that we will, we will never really leave the European Union. We'll get Brexit in name only. So we'll withdraw our commissioners and we'll withdraw our MEPs. And we will then, they, they will then present to the nation Brexit, get Brexit done. We haven't got Brexit. Uh, we haven't got anything like Brexit. The whole point of Brexit, and I made this very clear in that interview, it's on my website still, because nothing's changed. Everything's always the same. If you have to have uh, uh, Brexit, you, that had to be accompanied with other things. That had to be very big uh, reduction in regulation, big reg, uh, cuts in taxation. 
uh, and big cuts in the civil service, so on and so forth. It was a package. Brexit was a package. You can't just, there's no point of just leaving uh, the European Union and not picking up all those other aspects. So when people say, oh, well, you know, Brexit, how's it doing? Well, it's not doing well as we thought. We haven't had it. The long and simple answer is we haven't had Brexit. And now we are uh, seven years in or whatever it is. We're seven years in. The Parliament hated Brexit. Brexit Backbench, the House of Commons hated it. The House of Lords hates it still. The media hates it. BBC hates it. The civil service hate it. We, and so all these people have been sabotaging it. And now we've stepped away from even unwinding all those regulations that, that we were going to have, uh, that we were going to do. So we haven't had it. Now, the question is, will they try and get us back, back in? The answer is, yes, they will in some form. I think it will be covert, you know. Um, but here's what I think, too. The European Union will not be there in five years. We all assume Ooh, good. it's going to be there. It's not going to be there. Yeah. The, the, the driving force was Germany. Germany is now going down the lavatory uh, through the West's own stupidity. Um, and without German money and the German driving economic force, uh, the uh, European Central Bank is, is a disaster. The, num the numbers don't work. Uh, you've got the whole thing is a shambles. And sooner or later, it will just collapse. And it will reform in some form of you know, something else, but it won't be the European Union. There'll be nothing there to join. It's gone. I like it. I love your answer. I really hope you're right on that one. Now, again, I'm just looking at my clock now, and I can see that we've taken up a huge amount of your day. So just before we go, is there anything else you want to tell our viewers? Is there any anything you want to unburden yourself with and tell our viewers uh, before we completely wrap up for the day? Um, can I plug my website? Of course you can, yeah. Uh, my, website, my next question. Yeah, which is quite straightforward. It's just um, it's just godfreybloom.uk. Uh, and I interview, you know, I interview lots of good people or I am interviewed by good people. Uh, it's very informative. Alistair MacLeod, of course, is there. Klaus Grafs, all the people that we know from gold, uh, the implications of gold. Uh, and Colonel Douglas McGregor on the implications of the war in the Ukraine. It's rich, and the only I'm not blowing my own trumpet, I just edit most of it. Uh, the point that I'm making is people get frustrated. There's nothing on mainstream media. They're not being informed by mainstream media. People know that, get frustrated. If you look at my website, there's links uh, on, um, uh, on, on COVID, on health, uh, on climate change. Uh, there's a million words on climate change with graphs and all the rest of it, all contributed by independent scientists from all over the world, uh, not activists on the BBC like Roger Harabin, real people, real scientists who actually understand these. Be informed. So when your daughter gets home from school and says the world's going to boil, it's, it's, it's hopeless, I'm eight years old and there's no future for me, put her on my website. It's lots of lovely pictured graphics to show just what a tremendous hoax this whole thing is all about. Yeah. Yeah, so in 50 years, we might be as warm as the Roman Empire. And in 500 years, we might be as warm as the Holocene Maximum before we go into the next ice age, glaciation. Yes. Uh, anyway, that's been amazing, Godfrey. Thank you very much for your time uh, and answering all your questions today. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of our audience who've watched so far today. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Uh, and I'd like you to, if you can, if you can like and share and subscribe to help us push the podcast, that would be brilliant. It only remains for me to say thank you very much, Godfrey, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. And a pleasure to be on. <laughs>